The king of Egypt died, and the sons of Israel sighed because of the bondage, and they cried out. And their cry for help because of their bondage arose unto God. And so God heard their groanings, and God remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. And God saw the sons of Israel, and God took notice of them. And so we see uh, the mystery of spiritual covenants. Uh, we see something interesting that's going on here. I'm very confident that at this time in history, uh, slavery and hardship was a very common thing. And I'm sure that it was not only the Israelites who were enslaved. It was not only the Israelites who were in bondage. There must have been other people groups and other nations and other nationalities that found themselves in slavery and in bondage because that was a time of conquest. If a kingdom was to enter into another kingdom, one of the things that they would do is that they would slaughter the men and they would take the women and the children prisoners and they would begin to enslave those people. But we see some thing here. So even in that, I know that it must not have only been the Israelites who were crying out for help uh, uh, um, as a result of their bondage. The Bible says what? That they cried out and their cry for help because of their bondage arose unto God. The Bible says something interesting. The Bible says, so God heard their groaning and remembered his covenant. And so one of the things that happened was as they cried unto God, he heard them. But not only did he hear them, it seems as though that there was a connection that was made and almost like he remembered, he said, oh yes, these are the individuals that I made a covenant with their patriarchs. It says he remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. One of the things that happens in a covenant, and especially a covenant that is generational, is that it draws and it manifests the remembrance of God. It causes God to remember. And I'm going to talk about some things because uh, I want to put it in a balance for you. Now, a good example is this. If you choose and you decide to live a life of prayer, a life of fasting, a life of consecration, and a life which is yielded unto God, and you, you walk, you truly walk with God, you're known as a son of God, a friend of God, what happens is that when you transition from this earth, by the time you transition from this earth, God will make covenants with you. And the covenants that he makes with you are actually founded upon the covenant of that he made with Christ Jesus. Amen. So it's not a completely different. So it's not like you're a new Abraham or you're a new Adam. No, it's founded upon that. But what happens is that now because you've transitioned, even though you've transitioned, your bloodline is still operational on this earth. And because it's still operational on this earth, let's say you have grandchildren or great grandchildren. And they, for some reason, either they forget about the Lord or they end up in the world and they find themselves in an unusual and a strange situation. And all of a sudden, they begin to cry out to God. They may pray a simple prayer and they'll say, God, if you're real, show yourself to me. If you're real, manifest yourself. There are a lot of people who have prayed that prayer and nothing has happened. But there are some who have actually prayed that prayer and something has manifested. I was reading from Exodus chapter 2, 23 to 25, and something has manifested. And so they can pray that prayer and say, God, help me, help me. I, I may not know you. I may not be in deep relationship and covenant with you. But if you're, if you're real, if you're true, show yourself. And you'd be surprised now when God looks, first, the first thing that will happen is that God would hear, he'll hear the cry of that individual. He'll hear the cry of that person, and then he'll begin to search through the bloodline to see if there's anyone in that bloodline who had a covenant with him. And because you existed at a time, and you made a and you had a genuine and an intimate and a personal and a sincere relationship with God, God will rem he'll begin to remember his dealings with you. Maybe while you were alive, you prayed and you prayed a prayer and you said, "Lord, I'll serve." 
serve you all the days of my life, but my only desire is for you to not forget my generation. I, I desire for you to visit my children and my children's children and their grandchildren and their great-grandchildren. So by the time they begin to cry, what happens? Because of your covenant with the Lord, God remembers. Are you following me? So God hears their cry, and then he begins to search. And when he searches, he remembers. He'll remember you, and he'll remember your covenant with God. So this is exactly what is happening uh, with Ad, Sorry, with Abraham, with Isaac, with, and with Jacob, and with the Israelites who found themselves uh, in, in captivity in the land of Egypt. And so God established a covenant with Abraham. What is a covenant? A covenant is a legal contract or an agreement between two parties. And not only is it just a, a contract or an agreement with two, between two parties, but a covenant also has its own specific terms and it has its own specific benefits. And it's not just like a promise. You know, I could promise something to you and I'll forget and I'll forget about it, right? But you can't forget about a covenant because a covenant has legal ramifications. And so if you make a covenant with someone, it's literally like, it's literally like entering into a contract with them and they can take you before a judge and they can say, this person and I made a covenant. This, this person and I signed a contract, but they've reneged and the judge can now begin to judge you. Are you following me? So this is what a covenant is. So when you make a covenant with God, there's none higher than him. So the covenant that was made between Abraham and, and God, um, he was the overseer. And he was the judge. So that's what the Bible says what? The Bible says he swore by himself. Right. And so you see a few things now. You see a covenant being made with Abraham between Abraham and God. We see that in Genesis 22, 15 to 19. Um, the Bible says he swore by himself. He made a covenant between Abraham, between himself and Abraham. But then we see in the next generation, a new covenant isn't made, but rather this covenant that he made with Abraham is renewed with Isaac. I want to show you that. You see that, so the, the original covenant was made in Genesis 22. Sometimes it's good to read these verses so, because the word is just, the word in itself is just powerful, right? Genesis 22, 15 to 19, we see the promise. The Bible says, the angel of the Lord called unto Abraham a second time from heaven and said, By myself I have sworn, declares the Lord, because you have done this thing and not withheld your son, your only son. Indeed, and so the covenant is made. Indeed, I will greatly bless you. And I will greatly multiply your seed as the stars of the heaven. And he says, and as the sand which is on the seashore, and your seed shall possess the gates of their enemies. In your seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. Amen. Let me read it on, on this screen. Amen. That in blessing, I'm, I'm in verse 17, I will bless thee, and in multiplying, I will multiply thee as the stars of the heaven, and as the sand which is upon the seashore, and thy seed shall possess the gates of his enemies, and in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed, because thou hast obeyed my voice. And so there's a covenant, and one of the prerequisites of that covenant was obedience to God. And because of the obedience of Abraham, God was now willing to to swear God was willing to swear by himself you see that in verse 16 and so you see now that Abrahamic covenant is now renewed with his next in line with his 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 with the next generation which is Isaac and we see that in Genesis 26 2 to 5 and I'm saying this for a reason Genesis 26 2 to 5 it says, and the Lord appeared unto him. This is now the Lord appearing to Isaac because there was a famine in the land and Isaac actually wanted to go to Egypt, if I'm not mistaken. Yes. And Isaac went into Abimelech, king of the Philistines, unto 
Gerard, verse 2, and it says, And the Lord appeared unto him and said, Go not down into Egypt. He says, Don't go into Egypt. Dwell in the land which I shall tell thee of. Sojourn in this land, and I will be with thee. And so you see the prerequisite for the renewal of that covenant, once again, is what? Obedience. So for the covenant to go from one generation to the next generation, someone had to be found. There needed to be an individual that was found and that God could renew that covenant with. And so first it was Abraham, then it was Isaac. So this is now Isaac's um, interaction with the father, interaction with God. And he says, verse 4, And I will make thy seed to multiply as the stars of heaven, and I will give unto thy seed all these countries, and in thy seed shall the nations of the earth be blessed. And he says, Because Abraham obeyed my voice and kept my charge, my commandments. So he's saying the original the original reason this covenant was even made was because of your father Abraham. Listen, we talk about generational curses, but I want to tell you there's something as generational blessings, right? Your children can benefit from your interaction or from your relationship with God. Your children can benefit from your obedience. From what? From your obedience. Are you obedient to the voice of the Lord? Because if you're disobedient, then sometimes that's what opens the door for an ungodly pattern and cycle to be made manifest in the bloodline. But if you're obedient, you see the fruit of your obedience in the lives of your children. And it says, because that Abraham obeyed my voice. But there was still something that Isaac needed to obey as well, which was when he told him, don't go to Egypt. And so we see the covenant that was made with Abraham being renewed with Isaac, right? And then we see it again being renewed with Jacob. We see this in Genesis 28 from verses 11 to 15. It says what? And Jacob, verse 10 says, And Jacob went out of Beersheba and went to Haran, and he lighted upon a certain place and tarried there all night because the sun was set, and he took of the stones of the place and put them for his pillows and lay down in that place and he dreamed and behold a ladder set up to the earth and on top of it reached the heaven and behold the angels of the God of God ascending and descending on him. 13 says what and behold the Lord stood above it oh my God and said I am the Lord God of Abraham thy father the God of Isaac the land wherein thou liest I will to thee I will give it and to thy seed, and thy seed shall be as the dust of the earth. So then you see the renewal of the covenant. The renewal of the covenant. And thy seed shall be, let me read that in, in, in NASB so I can keep the, um, <laughs> the same flow. He says, and the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord, the God of your father Abraham, and the God of Isaac, and the land on which you lie, I will give it to you and your descendants. Your descendants will also be like the dust of the earth, and you will spread out to the west and to the east and to the north and to the south, and in you and your descendants shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Behold, I am with you, and I will keep you wherever you go, and I will bring you back to this land, for I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised. And so we see the renewal of the covenant. It's a covenant. It's the renewal of the covenant that was originally made to Abraham. Now, how many of you have heard the term covenant renewal, right? And when we often talk about covenant renewal, we're actually drawing from this principle. When God would visit the patriarchs and he would renew the covenant that was in originally made with Abraham. So when we come and we say we're taking the Holy Communion, which is what most of us have heard. You know, sometimes we hear these things and we don't even really understand why we say them. But we're saying covenant renewal. We're saying there was a covenant that was made. And what's happening is in this case, in this case, God was reminding or bringing to the memory of the posterity of Abraham, the covenant that he made with Abraham. But in this case, God isn't reminding us of the covenant. We're reminding him. That's why we say covenant renewal. We're saying, Lord, I bring into remembrance my system. 
my body. I'm renewing this covenant. And who was the covenant originally made for? So this covenant that is being renewed is not a covenant that is made or that was made between God and Abraham. Please understand. Listen, we are under a greater covenant. If someone asks you and says, are you under the covenant of Abraham? The answer should be no, because you are not under the covenant of Abraham now. You benefit from the covenant of Abraham, um, not directly, but indirectly, or let me say by extension, simply because Christ came out of, out of um, the nation of Israel, but you're not under the covenant of Abraham. Right? The covenant of Abraham was, was a foreshadow of the covenant that would be established between God and Christ. The Bible says this. I want to show it to you this in the scripture. How many of you are enjoying the Bible studies? Amen. Because the word, the Bible says, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of the Lord. This is helping you. The Bible says in Jeremiah 31 and 31, it says, let me pull it up here. The book of Jeremiah 31 and 31. So if someone asks you, because I know some of you, you've been taught that you're under the covenant of Abraham. You're not. Why would, why would you be under the covenant of Abraham when Christ has come? That is like saying that the covenant of Abraham is superior to the covenant of Christ, which is not. But the Bible says this. In Jeremiah 31 and verse 31, it says, Behold, days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a covenant with the house of Israel, with the house of Judah, not like the covenant which I made with their fathers in the day that I took them from their hand and brought them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant which they broke, although I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. <laughs> I don't even think we have time to get into that. But he says, but this covenant which I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declare the Lord, I will put my law within them and on their hearts will I write it. And I will be their God and they shall be my people. They will not teach again each man his neighbor and each man his brother saying, know the Lord for they will all know me from the least of them to the greatest of them, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity and their sins I will remember no more. But go back to verse 33. It says, and I will put my law within them. One of the things that happened in the old covenant was the law was not written within the heart of man, but the law, but the law was written on the stone tablets. Right? But in the new covenant, and this is being prophesied by the prophet Jeremiah. He says there's a greater covenant. He says you guys have broken the original. You see, they broke the covenant that was made to, to Abraham, actually, and the covenant that was ratified um, on Mount Sinai in the giving of the law, that one was broken. But he says there is a new and there is a better covenant that is being made. And this is the covenant that you have with Jesus Christ. Let me put it in a better way. This is the covenant that was established between Jesus and the Father. Why is this important to know? Because if you if you if you read throughout scripture, you begin to see God makes a covenant with Adam and Eve and they break it. He makes a covenant with those with those that come after Noah, they break it. He makes a covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and the Israelites break it. So you begin to see a pattern. And this pattern is that mankind is unstable. The nature of man is not one that is able to keep a covenant with God. God is consistent, but man is not. And so there is no way that God could release something that will bless the in that will bless all of creation perpetually through a man. Because one generation would come, and we see this in Israel. One generation is obedient, the next is not. 
Then they repent. Then the next generation is obedient. The next is not. So one generation would eventually come. If God was still making covenants directly with man, one generation would come and would mess it up for the other generations that are yet to come. So God sees this and he says, no, I cannot make a covenant with mankind because of their inadequacies, because of their instability, because of their double-mindedness. Because although one generation can be good, the next generation, no one knows where they're going to lean towards. So God says, I, I, if I'm going to make a, a covenant that is going to bless mankind, it cannot be made with mankind. But the problem is this. In order for someone to be a beneficiary of a covenant, they have to be a part of the covenant. Are you following me? <laughs> In order for someone to be a beneficiary of a covenant, they have to be a part of the covenant. So that's like me saying now, if I'm writing a contract between me and you and your cousin is implicated, it doesn't make sense. Your cousin can't come and say, hey, you know, I want to partake in this covenant, in this contract. I want to be a beneficiary of this contract, but they weren't there when it was written. They are a third party. In order for them to be a beneficiary of the contract, they have to be there and they have to sign their name. So now you have, so you so now the question is, how can God make a covenant with mankind without mankind? <laughs> oh my God. How can man what? How can man make a how can God make a covenant with man without man? I'm sure some of you know the answer. The Bible says, in the beginning was the word, and the word was was God, and the word was with God. The same was in the beginning with God. And the word became flesh. So this is one of the reasons that actually that Jesus had to. And now the Bible says what? He is a high priest forever interceding for the saints. He's consistent in his nature. He was able to fulfill the law. He was tempted in, 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 in like manner of all men. The same way that all men are tempted, he was tempted. Satan came to him directly and tempted him, and he did not fall. And so in order for God to make a covenant with man, or let me say, in order for God to make a covenant that will bless man without man, he had to come as a man. And so the Bible says what? For God so loved the world, he sent his only begotten son. Oh, my God. I don't know about you, but I'm getting, I'm, 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 I'm quickening over here. I'm getting excited because that really shows you how thorough God is and how powerful the coming of, how powerful but how necessary the coming of Jesus Christ is. So when someone says that Jesus Christ was just a man and he was not God, um, it, it, it's, it's insignificant. It's the, it wouldn't make sense for him just to be man. And, and not to be God. But then there are those who say Jesus Christ was just God and not a man. And, and if he was just God and not man also, then his sacrifice would not benefit mankind. He had to be 100% God and 100% man. Theoanthropus. Right? Oh my God. So now, the covenant that was originally made with Adam is now renewed in Christ. And so now there is someone who's standing eternally. Um, he's standing eternally as God, but also as man. Because the, the body that he died with is the one that he resurrected with, but a spiritual version. The body that Jesus has now is the same type of body that we're going to have when our bodies are renewed. Either one of two ways, when Jesus comes and our bodies are transformed in the twinkling of our eye, or when we die and we, and we are resurrected in the day of the resurrection of the dead. So, he's the, so there's a man in the Godhead. This was one of the reasons why Satan rebelled. Because man was made in the likeness and image of God. Because man was made in the likeness and image of God, he could now be represented within the Godhead. Whereas Lucifer said, I will ascend and I will be like the Most High. He had to ascend to be like the Most High, but Adam was made like the Most High. But we won't get into that because then, 
because then we'll have to talk about when Satan actually fell. Some people think that he fell before the creation of Adam and Eve. But we may have to do some, <laughs> some, some research and some digging concerning that. But we see Jesus now, so we, we see the covenant being established between the Father and between the Son. Between the Father and the Son. And so it doesn't mean that Jesus is less God than the Father. I don't have time to really explain the Trinity to you. But this is one of the things that actually is necessary for you to understand because some people think that it's just, it's just one God in a sense where one God manifests in three ways. That's not true. It's not true. The three are one. It's like a husband and a wife. The two are one, two distinct, two individual, yet one. Right? So we see a covenant being made between the father and the son. And because of the nature of the son, that covenant is now all of mankind can now benefit from that sacrifice. This means that we are beneficiaries of what has been accomplished through the relationship between Jesus and the father. It is the original covenant given to Adam and Eve. However, Christ with Christ being the focal point, not humanity, not a human being. Christ being the focal point. So now there's the messianic covenant. And so if someone says, are you in the covenant of Abraham? You say, no, I'm in a greater covenant. I'm in a covenant that is that encapsulate that encapsulates the sacrifice of Christ. We see that where? Matthew 26 and 26. Let's go ahead and read that. And then we're going to and then we're going to pray Matthew 26 and 26. This is so powerful because <laughs> imagine if God was still doing this dance with mankind. The dance that he was doing with the Israelites, one generation good, the next generation bad, the next generation good. I mean, <laughs> oh my God. Matthew 26 and 26, it says what? While they were eating, Jesus took some of the bread and after a blessing, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, take and eat, take, eat. this is my body. And when he had taken a cup and given thanks, he gave it to them saying, drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant. He's saying, which is poured out for the forgiveness of, of sins. He's saying what? He says, this is my blood. It's a sign, it's a token, and it's proof of the new covenant. Of the new covenant that you now have with the Father. And so the Abrahamic covenant was a type and shadow. It had really to deal with the physical prosperity of the nation of Israel, right? Um, but the Messianic covenant has to do with all forms of prosperity. He said, I wish above all things that you would prosper and be in good health even as your soul prospers. So soul prosperity. Those under the Abrahamic covenant, um, all the most that they could partake of after their death was the promised land because the veil was closed because those under those those under that covenant had no right to ascend up to heaven but under the new covenant we can commune we can ascend up to heaven and um after our transition of course so the abrahamic covenant had to do had to do with the land of canaan so you notice that when he spoke to Isaac, he said, remain here. When he spoke to Jacob, he said, on this place, this is, so it had to do with the land. That's why there's a lot of contention in the Middle East around that land, the land of the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Perizzites and the Amorites and that land. That's why there's contention. There's contention. Oh my God. But we are looking for a city whose builder is not man. Let me find that verse for you. Because it's, it's deep. Let me show you something. Let 
That's Hebrews 11 and 10. Because Abraham had a glimpse of this as well. Hebrews 11 and verse 10. It says what? Let's start from verse 8. It says, By faith Abraham, when he was called, obeyed by going out to a place which he was to receive for an inheritance, and he went out not knowing where he was going. By faith he lived as an alien in a land of promise, as, a, in, as in a foreign land, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, fellow heirs of the same promise. Who, for he was looking for the city which has foundations, whose architect and builder was God. Oh, my God. So the city that Abraham was looking for is actually the city that we are able, that we are, in, that we are citizens of. This is a, that city, New Jerusalem, that is going to descend from heaven. So this is why if you read, so Abraham had the ability to settle. But he did not settle. He lived as a nomad. He lived in tents. You're wondering, he's coming from a civilization that, that I mean, these, where he came from, where he was called out from, was a city. It was an establishment. They weren't living in tents. So now he leaves and he goes to this, to this land and he's living in tents. You're wondering, why is he living in tents? Why is he moving here to there, here to there? Why is he a nomad? Because... Uh, it's, 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 it's like a mixture. He's looking, the pro, he's looking for a city. And the city that he's looking for is not one that he would build. He's looking for, the Bible says, he's looking for a city which has foundations, whose architect and builder is God. Oh my God. And this was a part of what the children of Israel did not understand. And so it just became a top in the shadow. And and became a lot, a lot of contention around the Middle East. You know, because they say that the Garden of Eden is actually in, in, let's not get into that. But you see, he's looking for what? And in, he's looking for a city. But unfortunately, in that covenant, he could not enter in. Oh my God. He couldn't enter into that city. He, he, maybe he had a vision. Maybe he had an encounter where God showed it to him. So he's traveling all throughout the land of the Canaanites, and he's looking for what he saw. But he could not enter in because the Bible says, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom. It cannot be inherited by flesh and blood. But now we are citizens of that kingdom. We are citizens of, let me say, that city. Bible talks about it in the book of Revelation. It says, in that day the heaven and the earth shall pass away and a new and there will be a new heaven and a new earth without any bodies of water on the earth. The sun and the moon shall pass away and that city Jerusalem, new Jerusalem shall descend from the heaven and will rest upon the earth. That was the city that Abraham was looking for. That he journeyed. So you know, Isaac is asking, Father, why are we moving around? Why can't we get settled here? This is a nice land. This is a nice part of the land. He's a nomad. He's moving. He doesn't understand. His father saw something, but his father didn't understand that it's not a city that he can inherit with flesh and blood. And it's not a city that can be inherited in the old covenant. And so this is what makes the sacrifice of Jesus so powerful. Because it's giving you access to that city. as a result of the covenant that was ratified by the shedding of his blood. Are you following me? I hope you're understanding and I hope you're being blessed. Amen. So that is dealing with covenants, spiritual covenants. And so every covenant that is made, I know we're teaching for a while, but I, I think it's necessary. Every covenant that is being made between you and the Lord is not a new covenant. Right? No, it's a covenant that is already founded on the sacrifice of Jesus. All you're doing maybe is you're coming into, a, into contact with a dimension of that covenant that was already established between Christ and the Father. And so there are individuals who we call custodians. 
What is a custodian? A custodian is someone who is holded or who has come into the revelation of a certain dimension of God. So an example of a custodian was John G. Lake. He came into the dimension or the the dimension of, of the healing of healing. It's a dimension of God. And so he had a covenant with God as it pertains to healing. And so if you came out of his stream, you would flow like that because it was almost as if you were partaking of this man's covenant. It doesn't mean he's now a type of Christ. It doesn't mean that he's Abraham. No. All he's, all he's done is get a revelation of or a revelation of a dimension of Christ. And so that's why I said you can have a covenant with God. As you walk with God, God will make covenants with you. I'm telling you the truth. He'll make covenants with you. And when God makes a covenant with you, what he does is that he speaks to you. And he says, from this day forward, this will happen. That will happen. There's a man of God who's an old age. And he went through a lot. And Satan actually came to him in the flesh. And after that encounter, he lost people in his family. Things began to happen, but he stayed faithful and obedient to God. And after that trial, after that season of trial and tribulation, God actually came to him and says, because you are faithful in this season, I will cause a hundred angels to walk with you wherever you are. And so right now, if he goes somewhere and he preaches, he doesn't need to pray for people to be healed. He'll say, I'm not going to pray and people are going to get healed. And he'll have 5,000 people, 20,000 people healed if I pray. That is a covenant. That's not normal. <laughs> you follow me? That's not a normal thing. That's a man who has journeyed, who has walked with God, and God has established a covenant with him. But even that covenant that he has made with God, or that God has made with him, is, is, not, is not just by himself, is because or is founded upon the covenant of Jesus Christ. I'm sorry, this is going out of focus. It's founded on what? It's founded on the covenant of Christ, our Savior. Oh my God. So when so this is one of the reasons why we're praying. They say, why are you praying so much? Why are you fasting so much? Because I want God to speak to me. And I want to receive from God something that, only, that I can only receive from him. And I want to hear the voice of God speaking to me and saying, my son, this is what I'm going to do with you. This is what I'm going to do for you. This is what I'm going to do through you. That's the point. Yes. So through our priesthood, we come into personal covenants. Really, that's what priesthood, that's a portion of priesthood, covenants. We come into personal covenants with God. And it's not faked. <laughs> it's not faked. God speaks to you, and then you begin to see the manifestation of it wherever you go. So that person, John G. Lick, could probably wake up and, and start healing and raising the dead, and it's nothing to him. It's a covenant that's been made. I know a man of God, he has a covenant with God when it comes to the raising of the dead. He raises the dead like it's nothing. They follow me. And so, but you have to have walked with God and, 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 and lived a life of obedience, obedience, intimacy, and relationship with the Lord. So, the, so when I tell you that we're in a culture where everyone sounds the same, everyone prophesies the same, everyone preaches the same, it's all the same. The reason that is, is because not a lot of people have entered into covenants, into their covenant, into a personal covenant with the Lord as a result of their obedience, as a result of their, as, as a result of priesthood as a result of their consecration, as a result of their, of their relationship with the Lord. Not a lot of people. And so we emulate, right? And so what happens sometimes is that we can be brought into the covenant of someone else with the Lord, but it kind of dies down throughout the generations. So you have a man of God and say, he'll say, this is my spiritual father, and that was his spiritual father, and that was his spiritual father. And by the time you get all the way to the top, you say, my God, yeah, that was a powerful man of God. But then by the time you come down, you're like, you don't see that same type of manifestation. All, was, all, all that was happening is that one generation was brought into the covenant of another generation with God. Like, if I have a spiritual son, a part of, of, uh, of our communion and him, let's say, following me, serving me, is that 
I may pray for him to be brought into my covenant with the Lord, regardless of what that is. But now, the issue is that he still has to journey with God on his own. Because if he tries to pass on what I gave him, it's watered down throughout the generations. <laughs> Are you following me? It, it begins to be watered down throughout the generations. And so we need to be people who seek God, who are hungry for God, who are passionate about the things of the Lord, and who, who are willing to seek the Lord until he speaks to us. So this is why you pray. This is why you fast. This is why you seek the Lord, so that he can speak to you. When the Lord speaks to you, it doesn't matter. What, when, when God establishes a covenant, first of all, we thank God for the covenant of Christ Jesus. And then when God speaks to you and establishes, establishes a covenant with you, it doesn't matter what devil is in your bloodline. It be, they become insignificant. Demons become, those demons become insignificant as it pertains to that thing in which the Lord has spoken to you about. Oh my God. 